Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. I'm Xiao Wenzhen, the coordinator of the current series, Air Pollution and Human Health. I would like to welcome you to join our lecture today. And um, last week, we had a lecture on the health effect of indoor particle exposure and the intervention from Professor Zhou Zhao. And today, we are going to have the sixth lecture, Exposure to Air Pollution Mixture in an Indigenous Community in the Heart of the Oil Sands. Um, but before I start the lecture, I would like to give a short introduction about our honor speaker, Professor Jeffrey Brook. And Professor Brook is an currently assist, assist, assistant professor from Dallon Lina School of Public Health, the University of Toronto. And he is the one of the candidates leading expert in air quality. And currently he is in the research committee uh, Health Effect Institute in Boston. Professor Brook got uh, her, uh, his PhD from the University of Michigan. His research interests include environmental health, exposure assessment, urban air quality, and health effect studies. Professor Brew uh, got a lot of distinguished honors and awards such as the Distinguished Scientist of the Chinese Academy of Science of 2016 Honorable Mention Award from the Atmosphere Science um, <coughs> Librarian International um, Association and also got a Citation of Excellence Environment Canada in 2003 and 2012. Uh, okay, let's welcome Professor Brew. And I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay, good morning. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, is my screen being shared yet? Uh, no. Yeah. So, no, you, you change it. Click there. Could, could you I, I stop it? Maybe I can stop it. And now I can share. Yes, please. How's that? Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. So good. Thanks very much uh, for inviting me to be part of this series. I'm happy to tell you about um, Fort Mackay, Alberta. Uh, and some of the research that I'm doing there. Fort, My Fort Mackay, Alberta is an indigenous community. So um, uh, native uh, First Nations um, residents of Canada uh, that are in an area that's very close to where much development is occurring with respect to the oil sands. And um, I've been involved in research there through my previous position with Environment and Climate Change Canada uh, for many years, uh, and the research there continues today. Uh, some more background about Fort Mackay. So Fort Mackay, as you can see in the picture, in an area where there's a large amount of oil sands deposits that are occurring in uh, the northern part of Alberta. Um, it might be behind people's pictures. I can't tell from uh, my screen. Um, but many people's faces are right across the map. So that, uh, that area is uh, where they're located. There's uh, a number of different tribes there, Cree, Denny, over 800 band members, um, several living on the reserve, also Métis living there. And as I mentioned, surrounded by oil sands development, which represents a large source of employment and income for the people in the community and the region. Um, given their location though, there's ongoing concerns about the health risks that are coming from the air pollution emissions from the oil sands uh, and even other other releases that are occurring and getting into the food chain or into the water but uh, in terms of one of the most uh, obvious issues uh, odor from the area is one of the, the most obvious ones but uh, it's difficult to know whether or not that's posing a risk to the people in the community uh, the community because of the oil sands has quite a bit of capacity 
um, in terms of infrastructure and governance and able to help in research. Um, but still, the ongoing concern is there about, about the air pollution issues. You can see in the picture there, Fort Mackay in the very middle of the slide and, and the shaded areas are some of the very large developments of, of mining, surface mining, digging up bitumen and processing it to produce synthetic crude oil. So they're located uh, in many areas to the north and to the south. Just some background on air pollution in Fort Mackay. Uh, it's been monitored there for quite a few years given uh, requirements of, of permitting for industry and clearly concerns about impact. Uh, and some of the the things that have been observed over the last 10, 15 years leading up to our research uh, are shown in the graphs here. And you'll note the distribution uh, by the different markers of the concentrations of nitrogen dioxide and total reduced sulfur in Fort Mackay. Uh, and um, they're low in general, not as low, of course, as the background in continental Canada, but uh, low compared to major cities. Um, what's uh, noticeable here is that over that time period, there has been some rises, particularly in the number of larger, higher percentile events of nitrogen dioxide. Uh, so there's been a steady increase. Also, a slow increase there in the upper right in the total amount of hydrocarbons that uh, are in the community. Um, and down in the bottom left, you can see the amount of total reduced sulfur, which rose to a peak in terms of numbers of, of, of odorous events in around 2009, 2010. And with some control technologies has come down uh, to uh, what it was earlier in this century. A uh, little bit of look at the increase in um, hydrocarbons versus bitumen production to see that, that, that it scales fairly uh, readily with each other. Now, uh, odors have been a big problem, and that's led right up to the, today with uh, assessments by the energy regulator. And here's a number of odor complaints. Odor is a difficult thing to deal with. We can measure some of the compounds we think contribute to odor, but it's really some, a matter of perception and whether people bother to call in and make complaints. This here showed that, that even though the TRS sort of dropped around 2010-11, there seem to be an increasing number of complaints coming in. And uh, when they complain, they talk a bit about what they're experiencing. And this pie chart shows that that is um, coming from a number of different compounds, but the red is the, uh, the hydrocarbon, the oily smell, uh, gasoline type smell that they complain about the most. So while we focus on the reduced sulfur compounds, which produces more of the rotten egg smell, um, in terms of a lot of thoughts about odor, the hydrocarbon smells are what they seem to sense the most. And from my own experience driving through the area, it is often that more oily smell that's the more uh, pervasive odor issue. Another bit of background on what's been happening there. These are some images from the OMI satellite collected over the area, uh, looking at sort of the long-term average in the sort of larger background map and the Oil sands area is, is right up in this area, Fort McMurray, Fort Mackay. This would be Edmonton, Alberta, Calgary, Alberta, uh, Vancouver, and Seattle down here on the Pacific Northwest coast. Uh, and if we uh, see here from this, this broader perspective that the area of oil sands development shows up quite clearly in terms of nitrogen dioxide levels. Um, uh, these are estimated at the surface. But uh, if we zoom into that area, we can compare what has happened between uh, two different time period snapshots. So first on the upper is showing Fort Mackay there in the middle, and then the, the areas of development to the south, and the area that uh, show not much change from 25 to 2010 because the, the, they've been well developed and are producing um, synthetic crude. But the area to the north, you can see from this Landsat image, that from 2005 to 2010, there's been quite a bit of increase. And that uh, is paralleled by what we see here in terms of a, a zoom in on the nitrogen dioxide levels of the area of quite a bit of increase in the areas to the north of Fort Mackay in that period of 
2005 to seven versus 2008 to 10. And that's been raising concerns about what, what are the impacts of that very rapid growth. The satellite does correlate quite well with the surface. And here's some work of a colleague at Environment Canada, Chris McClendon, that related the um, measures from satellite uh, in the squares to the observations uh, at, at the ground. And here, here's the ground-based measurements uh, increasing. Here's the column measurements sort of showing a cycle over the time period uh, and the overall mass from satellites. So the top two are satellite measurements, the bottom are ground, uh, and they show fairly um, well correlated trends over this time period, helping to validate the use of satellite for more larger aerial studies. We've been ourselves doing measurement in that community, Fort Mackay, since 2013. Uh, we set up in the community a very intensive monitoring station that uh, received the name Oski Uten from the people in the community, which stands for New Wind in the Cree language. It's very much a partnership with the community uh, and located right in the center of the community versus some of the other monitoring that's on the outskirts. So a number of routine species are measured, like fine particulate matter and ozone, sulfur dioxide, but uh, it's been enhanced with improved methods for total sulfur, hydrogen sulfide, also sensitive methods for greenhouse gases like methane and CO2, um, and total oxidized nitrogen species, and some very important measurements that help expand our understanding around the um, hydrocarbons. Um, about 10 species we're able to look at with a GC uh, PID instrument uh, for VOCs. And then for particles, we've added more around black carbon, continuous pHs, and then with an aerosol chemical speciation monitor from Aerodyne, a number of, uh, of the constituents on the particles as well. So it's quite a, an advanced setup. You can see it sort of looking into the trailer here in the bottom right. Lots of inlets there up, up on the uh, top right, uh, supporting the different measurements. And also at this site, quite a bit of vertical profiling going on in terms of wind and meteorology. Here's a zoom in of the area, oski Uten site in the middle, uh, the industri industrial development sort of in, in many directions, not much to the northwest and west. So often when the winds blow from that area or the east, it can be like background. So they can go from very high levels when they're getting hit from uh, slow moving air masses with uh, atmospheric stability from the industry to virtually background levels. And that leads to very skewed distributions in the concentration measurements. Here's another look uh, at it. Now I wanna note that north is to the left. Uh, and what I wanted to show here is, again, the community, some of the very nearby industry that's occurring in, in the area and then the Athabasca River flowing right through it. Uh, and the Athabasca River uh, going through the industry to the south and then right adjacent to Fort Mackay is you know, creating a valley in the area. And the valley is a, a source of some heterogeneity in the atmospheric flow patterns that can occur at different times. This picture gives a good example of that, looking across the top of, of one of the industrial facilities and the river is along here, along the very top. And we can see that the plumes that are coming from the main facility here are dispersing and moving even in somewhat different directions from this perspective. And then further down in the river, at one of the other industrial locations, they're now getting into the river valley and fall, flowing along the river valley. So the flows can be quite complex due to um, differences in meteorology at the local scale. And that makes it difficult to really understand sources. Now I want to uh, point out that the uh, data that are being collected through the program, the Joint Oil Sands Monitoring Program, which was a partnership with the province of Alberta and the federal government, are all publicly available uh, for anyone to analyze. And uh, the, the web link that's there in the top, which we, I can help share if anyone's interested, provides all of the final validated data with about a one year lag time in the measurements. Um, many other measurements are also available at these websites. Uh, and we also produce from our ongoing monitoring, which is quite high time resolution, one minute or better for many cases, 
uh, these sorts of panels once a week that summarize the previous week's conditions. So this gives you an idea of sort of the richness of the data that's being collected at the site from the VOCs to the uh, particle composition uh, to meteorology uh, at different heights. Uh, and these images are also available at that link on the bottom. So with that data, uh, and in light of the recurring odor issues that the community brings to the attention of the regulators, their concerns about how that might be impacting their health, uh, but also the challenge that because of the way uh, the, the area is there, and as I mentioned, there are many days when there's not much happening with, a, with wind directions in certain, certain sectors, uh, and other times when it can be very high, uh, but uh, you know, in that context, we see that if you look at one single pollutant, their averages are very low and their distributions are highly skewed. But um, we look at single pollutants largely from the regulatory standpoint because standards are set one pollutant at a time. Yet in this area, given the, the, the massive nature of the de development there, what they're experiencing is not single pollutant exposures, but mixtures of exposures. So we wanted to use our data to, to look more closely at what the mixtures uh, are comprised of using data from uh, the startup in 2013 through 2016 uh, with principal component analysis to understand that. And then from there, put ourselves in the perspective of Fort Mackay and their experience of quite regular uh, episodes of odor, but also asking themselves, well, those are the ones we can smell. What about the things we can't smell? We can see it, but we can't smell it. So um, we wanted to look more at the episodes that they experienced, how often they experienced them overall. And then think a bit about how we might understand where some of the pollutants are coming from, particularly the VOCs and then NO2 because they've been rising. So here's an, uh, a, a snapshot of some of the data looking at, looking at it more closely, just to get an idea of what you can do when you measure multiple pollutants with high time resolution. And in this case, we have um, hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide in the, in the upper graph. So two you know, different forms of sulfur that do have different, different sources much of the time. And uh, you can see though that, that through this stretch in March of 2014, very often they're quite correlated with each other although sometimes their ratios can be different. So you know, here's a case where the hydrogen sulfide is larger than the sulfur dioxide. Here's a case where it's quite a bit different and also here quite a bit different. And even if you zoom in on different events, you'll see that the characteristics at a very short time scale often differ. Um, if we look at um, one of the hydrocarbons along with that, in this case, um, octane, now we start to see that they break apart in terms of when they're occurring. So this is the large sulfur event here, sulfur dioxide, and octane is not co-occurring. It's filling in the gap in time in this particular day. Although here's a case where it is co-occurring, where we've got quite a bit of this octane solvent and um, SO2 co-occurring. So sometimes they get quite nasty mixtures coming at the same time. Other time, uh, they're, they're mixtures of different things, sulfur species and hydrocarbon species, and they're separate. Sometimes uh, we can also use other valuable pollutants to help us understand something about the sources. And this is a quick example here where I've plotted again the octane and now methane. And there are cases, not always, here's one where octane rose up, but nothing really happened with methane. But here's two other times when methane and octane co-varied considerably. And it's this lack of or existence of covariation that we can exploit using something like a multivariate technique like principal component analysis, which is, what, which is what, what I did with the data. But I wanted also to really think about linking what we observed more back to what was emitted. Now we are very close to the sources, which means we do see the fresh emissions uh, predominantly but there is still secondary formation of particles and, and oxidant gases that do occur. But to get a stronger link back to what's being emitted, the, the, the approach I took was to only zoom in on the colder months when there's uh, much dark days, 
less photochemistry, a stable atmosphere which keeps the emissions intact as they move, and to only put into the principal component analysis pollutants that are largely primary, primary emitted pollutants. So you noticed in the column here that something like ozone is not included in there. Uh, and in terms of some fractions of the organic aerosol, I'm only including the hydrocarbon-like aerosol that you can derive from the ACSM measurements and the wood smoke, treating these as primary organic aerosol emissions along with the black carbon, but not including what's often seen in those AMS measurements, a large fraction of secondary organics. And also included in there are things like particle-bound PAHs, the sulfur, the NOx, a number of the hydrocarbons that were measured, uh, methane, carbon dioxide, and um, particles that are in the larger size, coarse particle and even larger PM10 to PM20 uh, super coarse particle volumes. So these are sort of some of the main things that are emitted primarily into the air mass and then have the potential to impact Fort Mackay. Now what the results showed was that we could we could see factors that, that made sense. The factor one, which explained the largest amount of the overall variance in the data I put in, was uh, related to a range of the different hydrocarbons or solvents used to process bitumen. Uh, and the, one of the highest correlated loaded on that was the octane that I looked at before. There's another hydrocarbon-like uh, not hydrocarbon like, but another hydrocarbon solvent based factor, factor five, and it's more indicated by methyl pentane and hexane with some of the higher loadings there. The uh, second one of importance is what's more related to the combustion emissions, with the, that being lined up a lot with the nitrogen oxides and the black carbon and the, and the PAHs, which we think are large diesel vehicles that are on the mining facilities. And then you can see that. Further down, we have uh, what's coming out from a lot of the work, the, the, a combined factor with sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide as sort of the main first six factors. Uh, some others show up further down, which are more related to natural cycling, like uh, methane uh, and carbon dioxide showing similar diurnal patterns and some other trace gases. But those are some of the main components. And if you, if you drill down and think about what they're telling us about sources, this is what uh, I've discerned from those measurements, is the first one is uh, really indicated by the octane, as I pointed out, uh, and that's indicative of a whole mixture of the naphthenic type solvents that are used to help remove the bitumen from the sand in the original processing once it's mined. So I call that bitumen processing one. I pointed out the other, um, solvents indicated largely by 2-methylpentane related to paraffinic solvents, so lighter, lighter solvents that are used by some of the other industries. So they don't all use the exact same process, and we're able to, to pick that up, which is uh, going to be helpful later to think about what, what industries might be contributing during certain events. There's a local gasoline exhaust factor that we see with isooctane, benzene, and carbon monoxide. I think that's largely local from the community. But also very much importance is dust from, from all of the open roads and the mining that's happening. And as I mentioned, the considerable amount of heavy duty diesel that's involved in the mining is having a big impact. Uh, this is uh, now the, the, the main types of mixtures that I wanna look at more closely. Uh, and I mentioned what, what they're sort of most related to. So while I use the principal component analysis to kind of get an idea of the types of mixtures, I'm really gonna go back to, to looking at the actual pollutants that now I have ascribed to being related to those mixtures to understand more about the occurrence of episodes. So OM stands for the organic matter on, on particulate matter that we can resolve from the aerosol uh, chemical speciation monitor. Uh, and these are the, um, so the um, hydrocarbons from the um, GCPID uh, built by Syntec. Now, I also want to point out that right here from that analysis, sulfur dioxide and H2S went together. But we looked at the warm season period to also understand what was going on in the area. And, and it showed what I expected, is that during the warmer months, we see that sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide don't co-occur. Uh, and that's driven by 
a couple things. One is that the hydrogen sulfide and other reduced sulfur compounds are coming from a number of sources, but one key source is the, is the tailings ponds. And the tailings ponds are frozen in the winter, so that source shuts off in the colder months. But in the other months, it's there uh, more predominantly. And also, the uh, sulfur dioxides, the bulk of it is emitted from tall stacks. And in the winter time, the tall stack emissions stay actually above the inversion and often don't impact the community nearly as much as they do in the summer. So in the summer, we see the sulfur dioxide showing a different temporal nature than the hydrogen sulfide, which remains from the tailings ponds and more near surface sources. So I actually wanted to keep them separate in my analysis of episodes. Uh, and this kind of shows it more if we look at the main breakdown of the total sulfur species. So the, the particulate matter, sulfate, is the orange part, and this is sort of overall percentage of sulfur, but it shows the um, increase in the importance of sulfur dioxide in the spring and summer months compared to the winter months. So in the winter months, sulfur dioxide is not as high because the bigger bulk emissions in the tall stacks are staying above the ground much more often, whereas with more mixing from daytime heating, they're impacting the site uh, in the spring and summer. And so that, that also points towards sort of the different types of sources that, that um, are occurring for sulfur that we wanted to resolve in looking at the episodes. Now, how did we define an episode? Uh, this has been a, a, a challenge for this community because um, if we were to look at each pollutant that we have a regulation for and compare it to current standards, that are there, air quality standards, it, they rarely exceed the standards as a sort of looking at as a single pollutant measure. And that's um, by and large because there is many, many clean hours that occur there. But um, the community, you know, being there, seeing and smelling and tasting the pollution, you know, is, is what, not really thinking about the standards, they're thinking more about, well, how do I describe what I'm experiencing and how do I understand its impacts? And so what, what um, I wanted to do in looking at the data then was to not just draw a line across the graph and say oh, only when it goes above the standard is there an issue. Um, and that you know, is also reinforced by the fact that there's much health research that indicates that, that uh, for pollutants, particularly something like particulate matter, you know, there really is no safe threshold. There are impacts that we can detect you right down to the lower levels. Uh, and so I wanted to not uh, really be bound by just above or below a standard in this analysis. And the way, to do, the way we did that was we said, let's look at the distribution of the data, and this is organic particulate matter, and determine what the 95th percentile was, what the uh, 75th percentile was, and, and here's an example of, of just determining that for organic particulate matter, and then go back to the time series of the data, and this is a smaller portion of the data to look at the time series, to try to isolate indiv individual events that met certain characteristics. One was that they had to have a certain length of duration, because events aren't just characterized by a 30 minute period going above, say, the, uh, an upper percentile, but events have a life history of a rising and a falling as the air mass comes in that's containing the pollutants. So we wanted to capture events more in their entirety from beginning to end. And we did that by saying an event starts when the 75th, 75th percentile is exceeded for a 30 minute period and ends when the 75th percentile is, is now, uh, the levels have gone below that. But also for it to be a substantial event, at least one measurement during that time when it would be above the 95th. And that allows us to go through all of the data and find events uh, for these different indicator pollutants. So this is an example of finding two events amongst the time series for organic particulate matter. Uh, and then just uh, saying yes, no, was there an, an event as done here, just by doing a, a, a check mark or a hash, a line uh, for the 30 minute periods that included an event. Uh, and you can see that between events, there's many, many hours that aren't events, some that are very low at background. Uh, and that's the way things occur there because of the main predominant source being the industry and it's within a very clean continental background. Shading over here are periods when there wasn't enough data because of the uh, inevitable data loss that occurs. And so we weren't able to classify these periods as an event. But 
for the one pollutant we found that in this case 11.1 percent of the time uh, the community was experiencing an organic particle event and we can look at at that over longer time periods um, and isolate numbers of events for the, the, the full stretch of data that are available. So this would be the organic particulate matter measurements. Here's a block of missing data where we can't say whether an event occurred, and we can, we can, we can extrapolate and fill this in by using the, the seasonally observed event frequency to try to account for that missing. Uh, but what we end up with is sort of this almost looks like a barcode on a, on a product. The, the time periods where events occurred during the course of our measurements. Uh, and again, 10% of the time is when they're in an event for this one pollutant. And if we look at how long events typically last, we see that, that depending on the different indicator pollutant and the different type of event, they last different lengths of time, but they're, they're largely, yeah, by definition, longer than two hours, but, but quite a bit longer than that. If we look at sort of the median length of time, an organic particulate event is almost nine to 10 hours in duration for its typical length. Uh, and dust also, you know, pushing seven, eight hours in length. Uh, sulfur events also longer. So when people in the community are experiencing an event, it's not just a, a quick hit of, you know, maybe 30 minutes or an hour. These, these are lasting for a considerable length of time and impacting upon uh, their quality of life and where they live. Now what we're able to do is to go through every pollutant and identify their frequency of events in the, in the gray. So in this case, you can see how I've stacked it up for the events that occurred for the main indicator species of the different types of mixtures that the community experiences. Uh, and then uh, put down their frequency of occurrence here, uh, one by one. So they range from about 13% down to around 10% in, a, in occurrence in the community. But um, I wanted to ask the question as to, well, uh, you know, are these all co-occurring? So really, they only get these sort of bad episodes of dirty air 10% of the time? Or are they actually occurring at different times, which seems logical that that would happen given the vastness of the uh, areas of industrial development surrounding them that you saw in those earlier images. And what we find then is if we say, well, let's look at each 30 minute period and, and count it if any one of these was within an event during that time. Uh, and you know, if there's two, then we count two. So this bottom plot summarizes that for the different events. And if there's any one of them in an event, it'll get you know, one tick mark for, for black. And then uh, if there's two of them that are co-occurring in an event during a period, then we keep stacking it up. So you can see there are times when, when there are of these different types of mixtures, six and seven of them co-occurring as events in the community. Periods that you would think are probably the least desirable uh, and most complex mixtures that they're breathing. But uh, for in terms of um, at least one, we see that 50% uh, of the time, I don't know if it's behind some of the, the there we go, 48% of the time, they're experiencing at least one type of event in the community. Uh, so that tells a much different picture than if you look at trying to understand the impact of air pollution one pollutant at a time. Nearly half the time, they've got uh, some pollutant of concern that is up in its higher levels of concentrations to the extent where they you know, are noticing it and being impacted. Um, you know, one of them, uh, I indicate by the the um, naphthenic solvent mixture, the octane, which they see quite a bit. Octane is one of the higher levels of uh, pollutants. So I wanted to drill down more closely, taking advantage of the data that we have, just to better give people an idea of that mixture that's there. Uh, and this is a plot here where we looked at a, a range of other pollutants that we were able to measure with canisters to see what else is, is occurring with the octane. And by saying occurring with the octane, that means that they are um, highly correlated in their temporal variability. In this case, greater than a 0.9 correlation in their temporal variability suggests they're coming from the same source or uh, a very similar location and then impacting the community as a mixture. 
and you can see the range of other hydrocarbons that are blowing over the community um, when we see these high octane periods. Um, and some of the other pollutants that uh, occur with it that aren't quite as highly correlated, but uh, that are also in this mixture. And in this case, if we look at the methyl pentane, the, the, the um, paraffinic solvents, these are some of the, the compounds that are within the paraffinic solvent mixture. So it's not just the single pollutants that I'm using, just more for convenience to analyze the, the different nature of event occurrence. So given the odor being attributed often to an oily uh, gasoline type smell, given the different types of events, given that we know that the, the, the industries are using uh, and mandated to recover uh, a large amount of solvents to pro process the bitch, and we thought, how can we say a bit more about which of these main local facilities surrounding it might be contributing to the observations? So this is a zoom in again of Fort Mackay in the middle and some of the larger developments that are in the region. And in 2013, uh, colleagues in Environment Canada led by Dr. Xiaomeng Li did some extensive aircraft measurements and flew around all of these facilities under certain wind directions and through mass balance calculations, were able to quantify quite accurately the amount of emissions of a, quite a wide range of pollutants, one of them being the VOCs. And they did that by flying these boxes at different heights around the facilities depending on the wind direction. And you can see here an example of one of the facilities, and I'm gonna go back, so their facilities have names, CNRL, Red, to the northwest of Fort Mackay, SAG, Shell, Albion, Jack Pine, now also owned by CNRL towards the northeast, and then straight to the south, the Sincrude Mildred Lake, and then more to the south, southeast, Suncor, and these are the most widely uh, long-living facilities uh, that have been impacting the community's longest. This is where the growth took place, if you remember. So uh, the aircraft was able to fly at multiple heights around the, fa the facility perimeter, and by mass balance calculations, estimate things like the amount of toluene that's emitted. In this, this example, we're showing toluene. So you can see the plume of toluene from the, from the facility as a whole, actually blowing, in this case, northward, right across Fort Mackay, which would be right in this area somewhere. Uh, or in this case, this is a wind that's to the south, looking at the, the Suncor facility and the complexity of toluene from different parts of the facility that are observed. That's uh, an example of the flight patterns and what can be seen. The, Xiao Meng Li and, and the team were able to look at a large range of VOCs by grabbing canisters when they were in the plumes and relating that to their high time resolution VOC measurements to come up with these, these source profiles for these four main facilities. And if we rank them in terms of their uh, prevalence by one of the facilities, the Syncrude Mildred Lake. We see that octane is the most prevalent there. Shortly after that is heptane, 2-methylheptane, and so on down the list. But the other facilities look considerably different, which is what we uh, really want to be able to see if we want to be able to use receptor methods to identify which source might be contributing to the Fort Mackay. So, so I hope from this you can see the uh, diversity of the mix of the emissions coming from these four main facilities. Uh, and if we now look at these sort of yellow areas. These yellow areas are the compounds that we were measuring with our 30 minute semi-continuous GCPID instruments. So benzene, 2-methylpentane, heptane octane, xylene, toluene, ethylbenzene, hexane, uh, and, and oxylene. And um, how they differ between communities. So for example, we can see that that the ratio of heptane to octane is different amongst all of them. Uh, and we can exploit that quite simply. Uh, and here's an example of try to tracking these compounds. So um, here's heptane and octane here, showing that uh, here's a case where uh, the octane is much larger than the heptane in an event. And here's cases where they're similar, and here's cases where it's the opposite. So we actually do see these varying ratios depending on events, which says where well, there might be promise in using those source profiles and fingerprints to be able to 
identify what are the, contrib the contributing local industries to what they're observing. And as sort of a proof of concept, we look at just the heptane octane mass uh, ratio that we observe, which is the red line for a series of events. Uh, and if we then compare that to the ratios from that source profile that uh, is here, which is indicated by the um, lines, the syncrude ratio, the SML and the Suncor SUN ratio here, or the outer ranges of the ratios based on the, the error bars from the source profiles, and then compare what we observed in the community, we can see that when we look at the winds coming all the time during the episode from the south, so this is 100% from the south, and then this is less and less wind from the south and more from other directions, and these, these events down on this end, that they are indeed falling within the observed ratios from the aircraft, indicating that we see good consistency between our observations at the surface and the more controlled aircraft observations. So we, we thought we'd go further then and use this other approach for, for uh, quantitative uh, source apportionment called chemical mass balance approach which is a well-developed technique that is uh, available online uh, from some of the resources of the US EPA. And people have used it for doing source apportionment for particulate matter, for VOCs, uh, and it can use for any sort of mixing, mixing type model uh, to understand what might be contributing to the overall observed mixture. Clearly, there are assumptions in that, and a couple of the key assumptions are that, that if you want to um, explain what you observe uh, using this mass balance approach, you need to put in individual source profiles that account for all the different potential sources that are impacting. And that um, from the, the, the location where it's emitted to where you measure that there is no chemical reaction or no chemical losses, that these, these fingerprints are preserved. And the, neither of these assumptions are really 100% true. But in our context with these species and their lifetimes and the distances involved, there is fairly limited conversion away from the compounds in that, in that time period. Uh, and uh, so we have some good promise that we can use chemical mass balance to help answer this question about sources in that area. So this is a larger range of species that's similar to the other graph I showed that went up and down. Uh, and then within that, here are again the compounds that we were able to measure with 30 minutes. So at our site, we had, we had canisters done by the same laboratory as done uh, for the aircraft study, which measure this larger range of compounds. But those are only collected every third day for a 24-hour average. So not a lot of resolution to understand uh, how the sources could change depending on with variations in the wind speed and wind direction. But the 30-minute measurements from the GCPID allowed us to look at that, that temporal resolved uh, a source apportionment by zooming in on just the fingerprints of these these main species that we measured, the nine syntax species versus 53 from the canisters. Uh, but we had to um, also consider that those four facilities aren't the only sources. The, the um, CMB, or not the CMB, the PCA analysis indicated that there is local gasoline emissions that are having an impact and there is other local traffic in the community uh, there's traffic on the major highway going north-south that's not included in the facility emissions. Uh, and then there's also a background level of the VOCs. So we created the fingerprints for the four facilities, but also from databases that are available from the resources to run CMB from the United States Environmental Protection Agency. We could get typical profiles that are observed for diesel and gasoline engine emissions, and also from looking at periods when we know the facilities weren't impacting Fort Mackay based on wind directions, what the profiles looked like for the background air. Uh, and then use those to say, now we're able to, to run CMB and we know we've got uh, all of uh, the likely sources that are in there to explain the observed mass. Uh, and what we did after some more sensitivity analysis was realize that we could include uh, one profile that was everything else, the background, by combining the diesel and gasoline in the background together. And so in our runs, what we did was we used one background that's kind of the residual in the area, and then 
the, the four main sources and ran the chemical mass balance using that approach. And what that uh, showed was that, as one might expect, if you look over three different events, and these are three octane events that came from those earlier graphs I showed of, of them occurring about 10, 12% of the time. And these are some of the more significant octane events that occurred when they were uh, accompanied by a range of other pollutants in the mixture. So complex, significant events. And this is the variation in the concentrations during that time. So the events are starting from you know, above the 75th percentile, the, passing the 70th percentile, and then a peak in the middle when it went above the 95th. In these three examples, you can see differences in the tem temporal nature, differences in the compounds, these are the various compounds, differences in the mixtures as well. Uh, and then in the top here, you can see the uh, variation in wind direction during the event. So this is surface measurement wind direction in the red, and then this is what we call the wind RAS. It's this uh, uh, um, acoustic sounder profile getting wind direction above the ground. And sometimes they are in pretty good agreement, and other times they vary because of vertical um, wind shear. But uh, what we can see in the bottom is the contribution from the different facilities and the background down here indicating that that we're able to explain a large percentage and typically between 90 and 90 to 100 percent of the mass can be explained by just including the source profiles of the facilities and the background was only important at certain times and a fairly small percentage of the total what's also striking is the changes that occur in which sources are important so here's one here where during the, the larger bulk period of the event, this was dominated by um, the um, SAJ site, Shell, Albion, Jack Pine. And then later on, uh, other sources came in. And even though we can see this in the chemical fingerprints that tell us that certainly there's something different in the mixture, there was very little change in the wind direction that occurred at that time. So, uh, you know, wind is important to help diagnose but we get more sensitivity in what's coming from where from the, from the detailed chemical measurements. Now, if we summarize all the results, here's some sort of preliminary findings where we've summarized the results from uh, a large number of all of the events. So events are varying in length from two to 12 to 15 hours. Uh, and there you're know, meeting those criteria I mentioned versus also looking at using the larger range of compounds and the 24-hour canister measurements. And so what I have here are the percent contributions during different seasons of measurement for the four main sources in the area. And the uh, dark lines are what we obtained from the 24-hour canister measurements. Uh, and then the colored lines are what are coming from the more time-resolved measurements that we were able to look at for specific events. And uh, what we find is, is there are some differences. And here's an example here where if we look at the Syncrude Mildred Lake facility, which is actually the closest one to the south, um, it has the, the, lar the largest overall impact during events at, at being responsible for what's being observed around 60% of the time on average. Uh, but if you look at the, um, non the overall period, so events and non-events from the canisters, it's more down around 30% of the, of the overall VOC mixture that's observed. Uh, conversely, you can see that there's a change in the impact of the Suncor facility. During events, it's less important than the, the Syncrude Mildred Lake, but on average from these 24-hour measurements, it's slightly more important. Or the actual closest facility to the area, uh, Shell, Albion, Jack Pine, where on average it's about the highest at around 40%, uh, but during episodes, a little less. So uh, um, having different types of measurements helps to, I think, constrain the results, gives us some confidence in using the different techniques, and given that they're independent measurements at different time periods, uh, helps fill in the, the entire story about the source contributions. So if you wanted to go after the periods when there are events occurring that are leading to probably more of the odor they experience, You'd be leaning towards more this facility and having some dialogue with that facility. If you want to go after sort of long-term chronic exposures, you might think about uh, actually all facilities almost having equal contribution. 
perhaps maybe the one farthest to the northwest having the least as one might expect. Now, um, in a little bit of time left, I want to switch and talk about how we can gain some insight about the, the contributions from nitrogen oxides. And now we don't have, you know, for something like NO and NO2, we don't have the, you know, the, the range of different compounds that you have in VOCs to really apply any source apportionment approach. So if you're trying to understand what sources are contributing to nitrogen oxides, you're really stuck with um, a couple approaches. And one would be just to look back at the emissions inventory and what's reported in the inventory. And the other would be to um, use an air quality model. And then from the air quality model, like the, like the CMAC model or Canadian's model, it's known as GEMMAC, to run the model and turn sources on and off and see how that changes the contributions in different areas. Uh, those are all both uh, giving you a good idea of, of what's important, looking at just the inventory amounts. Uh, or running a model. Now the latter, a model is quite labor intensive and not everybody can run a model. Uh, and, and also, you know, using just the emissions inventory doesn't tell the picture about actually what's going on at a given point. So we wanted to try to see if we could learn a bit more about that from our Fort Mackay measurements. And, and the way we did that was is that we said, well, often uh, NOx is coming or predominantly always coming from combustion, high temperature combustion, and it's going to be accompanied by carbon dioxide, CO2. So we start, we zoomed in and looking at the carbon dioxide and NOx ratios. And these are scatter plots comparing the concurrent NOx and carbon dioxide measurements. And if we looked at all the high events for the period there, 2013 to 2015, you can see that there's quite a bit of scatter. Maybe there's sort of one predominant line that's more of a steeper slope than what the regression line shows, but a lot of scatter. Uh, now, if we try to narrow it down and say, let's look at, at nighttime when the atmosphere is more stable and maybe plumes stay more intact, uh, maybe the scatter reduces a little bit. But if we look at more colder, stable conditions, uh, which would mean looking at the winter time, like I did for the principal component analysis, we can see that uh, now with uh, more intact plumes, we see uh, a much clearer picture coming in terms of the predominant ratio. Uh, and if you refine that to even colder times, but and at night, maybe even a little bit tighter relationship, suggesting that by being smart on capitalizing on our knowledge of meteorology uh, and how it varies seasonally and diurnally, we can start to get a clearer picture of the, the NOx to uh, CO2 ratio. And here's a snapshot of a certain time period, just lining up events to show that while those plots have quite a bit of scatter, if you look at individual events, which may then be uh, pointing towards uh, a, a certain source contributing, that, that the ratio, and this is now the ratio of NOx to CO2, there are periods when the ratio becomes quite steady, suggesting that it's a, a common source impacting during the, the period of the different episodes. And these are, these are the length of times of different episodes here. But others, like for the VOCs during episode, the ratio can vary, suggesting that different sources of NOx have been contributing to that duration of that NOx event. What we did was, is that we went and we, we isolated all the events uh, very carefully when NOx and CO2 were quite tightly correlated above 0.85, so we know they're being co-emitted and said, now what uh, are the ratios that were observed in NOx to CO2 during these periods when we, we believe they're coming from the same source and they're co-emitted? And that ratio we can get from the slope of these lines for the different events. And the slopes you can see basically range from 2.4 parts per billion per ppm uh, uh, on average to 0.8 to 12 over the range of what we observe at the site during NOx events. And if we now use uh, information in the literature, we can, we can try to get a feel for whether those ratios make sense or not. Uh, and surprisingly, uh, the, the group at Desert Research Institute in Reno, Nevada, went uh, there and did measurements 
on the actual heavy haulers that are carrying the bitumen from the mines to be processed, which are a major source of NOx in the area. And what they observed from the heavy hauler tailpipe measurements were ratios that were much larger than what we observed. 17 for one, one brand of heavy hauler on, in terms of the median measurement in the ratio, 32 for the other. So huge amounts of NOx they observed uh, per CO2 coming out uh, during these periods often which were idling and at, at low speeds. Now, if you look at other sources though that are impacting the area, this team from Desert Research Institute also measured the main stacks and the uh, flue gas desulfurization unit stacks as well. And for those, the ratios were down at, at 1.7 to 3.2 for the stacks uh, or one to 1.6 for the uh, fluid gas desulfurization units. Uh, these are more in line with what was observed from those aircraft measurements in the region uh, that were around 1.2. And if we look at um, other measurements around stacks and power plants reported from, from NOAA in Texas research, they're seeing even lower values around uh, 0.2 to 0.3 in natural gas plumes and a little bit higher, 2 to 2.5 two in the coal fire power plant plumes. Um, but in these ranges that are perhaps getting a little bit closer to what we observed. Now, again, we observed on average 2.4, but ranging from 0.8 to 12. And if we zoom in on more on what we know about diesel, because the emissions inventory certainly suggests that large heavy hauler diesel trucks are major contributors. Um, and so if we zoom in more on what's, what's been seen in the diesel, here's a couple graphs from some studies looking at Mexico City, Austin, Texas, or um, here in Texas again, and, and looking at chasing vehicles and looking at a range of trucks and their ratios uh, versus speed. Uh, and you can see that at, as you get to higher speeds, uh, you get higher temperatures and greater NOx production, but these values are ranging from around one at low speeds to, to um, maybe 10 at higher speeds. Uh, and on average in Texas, around a little over four. Uh, in Toronto, we recently reported ratios that we observed on the roads in the area of around 1.2, so closer down into to this end from the vehicles we have observed. Uh, and now sort of using these values and thinking about, again, what we observed, uh, we, you know, we aren't able to really come to a real firm conclusion about the source of the NO2 in Fort Mackay, um, it's nowhere near the heavy hauler measurements that they obtained from, you know, fairly isolated numbers of studies in the area. Uh, and so we need to be talking more with them about those data to, to understand what uh, uh, were some of the parameters that uh, they had and how confident they are in these ratios, given that they had really made other priorities than getting the NOx CO2 ratio for part of their work. Um, but, you know, our values are are, are higher than gas fire boilers, higher than sort of the probably the more elevated stacks that were observed from the aircraft study. And, and getting, I think, more closer to some of the, the typical diesel values that we got, certainly for, for some of them going up above, up above the 2.4. So I think that we are seeing what, what one would expect from the inventory, that the uh, <clears throat> emissions from the um, diesel heavy hauler trucks are having a considerable impact on the NOx episodes, but the jury's still out there. More work needs to be done to, to fully interpret that. Supporting the observation that, that the trucks on the mines are, are major contributors is the observation back in the PCA analysis, which showed that um, uh, there is a certain uh, frequency of occurrence of NOx events that are also coming quite tightly correlated with methane. And we know methane is coming from the mine faces where the trucks are operating. So we think that the methane is also a tracer pointing us uh, now sort of through an independent uh, observation towards the mine faces and the trucks. So just to summarize, uh, we're really, I think, learning a lot about uh, air pollution insight by measuring multiple pollutants with high time resolution over a long time period. This is a sort of very rich data that can, can give us this this type of insight and, and much more than what I've shown here today. We can see and discern multiple types of air mixtures that are consistent with what we know is going on in the area. And nearly half the time, the community experiences an episode of 
of one or more of these types of different mixtures. So, you know, they are considerably impacted and it's important for us to, you know, look further into what, you know, that impact really means in terms of things like health and environmental issues. Um, the NOx to CO2 ratios are not uh, pointing specifically towards uh, being a very clear diesel source, but it seems to be more consistent with that than others uh, and more work needs to be done to understand those results. Whereas the VOCs and the, and the more uh, uh, informative source profiles, I think are helping us to get more quantitative on some of the main sources that are contributing there with uh, Syncrude being a, a main contributor at around 40 to 60% during events. But on average, as I mentioned, the, the, they're, uh, they're more equal in terms of the sources, all more around close to 25%. So uh, I, I hope this has been an informative lecture for you. I appreciate your attention. I want to certainly thank the, the team that uh, worked with me at Environment and Climate Change Canada, Chris Mihila, Jimmy Chang, and Gang Liu, who were uh, very important in having Oski Uten operate and run. Also, along with uh, the technical team led by Andrew Shepard, the data management team led by Andrew Alford, uh, and uh, Kathy Hayden and Richard Minnemeyer, who operated the greenhouse gas measurements uh, and the local community led by Ryan Abel, our, our, our lead manager, Stuart Kober, and the postdoc working with me on the CMB work, Sumi Red. Uh, so I want to thank you very much for your attention. Uh, there's uh, my email address if you want to have any follow-up questions. Okay. Thank you. That's Professor Bruce, the wonderful talk. And uh, we are now open for the questions. If you have questions to Professor Brook, you can type your question uh, in the chat box so that we can see. Now, uh, Professor Brook just told us a very good story what happened in the um, Fort Mac Mackay, that's the oil sand in the, the, the community there. What happened to the air uh, pollution? And you, used, you had very nice data. You had different times monitoring and intensive monitoring and it shows us lots of the hundreds of chemicals in the, uh, uh, the, the, the atmosphere. So um, I'm curious about, since there's the oil sand, um, does the local government take some actions to, you know, to just try to control the air pollution there? They do. Uh, you know, each industry has, um, you know, committed to a certain total amount of emissions in a year, and uh, then uh, monitoring is put in place, like some of the other sites, not Oskewton, to track their impact. Um, and um, that's that's generally been saying that they're, you know. But what's there is that, well, they seem to be complying with what's being required because there aren't any major impacts. But, but again, they, you know, they look at the impacts based on one pollutant at a time uh, and single pollutant standards. Uh, and that doesn't tell the whole story that we've been able to report from these data. Uh, and also, the aircraft measurements have been revealing that if they look very closely at a top-down uh, measure of emissions and compare it to the reported emissions that uh, in almost every instance the emissions coming out are considerably larger than what's being reported uh, and so that's that's pointing towards the need for more uh, verification of the emissions um, and a different monitoring strategy um, and more more research on on impacts than what they've been doing so far Okay, okay, thank you. Because we are doing the environmental health, so uh, identified predominant air pollutant uh, in the atmosphere is very important for us to understand the health impact. So you did a lot of the great job there. Um, well, we have the question from the Jacob. Yeah, I can't see that. Where do I select to see the questions? Yes. Oh, chat. 
Okay. All right. Two questions. Okay. Uh, so one question is about the data link. Um, and uh, certainly you can email me about, about the data link. Um, and then you can obtain those data and, and look very closely and hopefully lead to some other more important conclusions for the area. And yes, there are um, quite a few stations in the, in the region. So um, that's been a provincial responsibility. Back to that previous question. The industries you know, are given um, uh, you know, a permit to operate, regulations for how much they can emit, regulations for what they're supposed to report. And then the monitoring that they partially support is, is established in the area to try to track that. So that monitoring is led by an organization called the Wood Buffalo Environmental Association, WBEA. Uh, and from the WBEA website, you can obtain um, many years of monitoring data. And I, I can't name the, exactly the, the total number of stations that they operate, um, but it's, it's, it's a fair number. Um, each station doesn't measure all the same things, and none of them have the, the richness of the measurements that we've provided at OSCU. Um, our stations, I see you said they're on wheels, and yes, that's right. They, they are not moving for our work. In separate research, I've, been, I've done a lot of work with a mobile laboratory around cities, but uh, in this case, they're on wheels because after we spend our five or so years there, we do you know, plan to bring all the equipment back and then have the ability to deploy it to other locations of interest. Um, now another question about heavy metals. Um, yes, absolutely, that's a very important uh, aspect of the particulate matter in the area. And uh, ourselves, uh, in the Oskiyutin site, we have not been doing the metals because they're, they're pretty difficult to do with a higher time resolution, which was more of our focus on the higher time resolution. But uh, the Environment Canada lab that works with us, that does sort of the routine filter-based monitoring, has collected PM2.5 and coarse particles and, and then analyzed them for metals. So they have, they have those data. We've used those data and published a couple papers now on using that for source apportionment analysis. Some key metals like vanadium and nickel are very high in the bitumen. Uh, and the um, groups that have been studying deposition have gone around the oil sands, and maybe some of you have seen this literature, and collected snow samples in the spring, and then looked at what has accumulated in the snow as a proxy for the accumulated deposition all winter. Uh, and they do, they find you know, quite high levels of, of some of the metals and also of some of the polycyclic aromatic compounds uh, and, and mercury in you know, a sort of a, a circular pattern that drops off with distance. Um, so Professor Brook, and there are more into the data, so they are, they are available online. I mean, if the other collaborators really want to, you know, cooperate with the... Yes. So, so yeah. they are all available online. Is yeah. free accessible? Yes, free, online. That's part of the, the major uh, requirement of that Joint Oil Sands program was for them to be uh, making all the data available to all users to uh, encourage open data, open science, uh, being transparent with findings. Um, so the, the data that are, are measured on a real-time basis, they're delivered to one of the links that I can provide uh, every week uh, as so, sort of you know, raw data. And then uh, with about a one-year lag, all the other data get posted. And that's the other link that I can provide. Uh, and, they, and they come in separate folders for the different pollutants and the different instruments with the with the the best time resolution available <clears throat> so for analysis someone would have to you know bring those in and then you know create whatever sort of average time window they'd want to use in my case i know that our least time resolved instrument was 30 minutes so i averaged things that were even like one second resolution to all to the 30 minutes for the analysis <laughs> 
Um, That's great. So um, there are a number of health issues in the community. Um, and um, we're in the middle of doing studies on that now. So with uh, their interest and concern, not just in what's there, but what it's doing to them, we've we have joined, uh, myself with Fort Mackay, we've joined a large national study called the Canadian Alliance of Healthy Hearts and Healthy Minds. Uh, and that is a national study of, of the broad determinants of health, which includes environmental factors, in eight different First Nations communities across Canada. So Fort Mackay is one of them. We've collected some pretty uh, incredible data uh, as a baseline, which we just finished a year ago, uh, and are now embarking on looking at uh, if we can observe differences between communities. Some are much more remote versus uh, Fort Mackay versus some are actually in Southern Ontario. So the work is just beginning on the health issues. There's a lot of controversy on that topic. Uh, and so we're, you know, we're going slow and careful, doing a thorough approach to the health analysis. So stay tuned on that. That's something we'll be doing over the next three years. Um, I can see one last question about, about selenium. Um, it doesn't seem to be showing up as nearly as uh, prevalent in, in the snow samples as, as vanadium. Now, I, you know, you're, you're, you're talking quite a bit more about, about selenium and sulfur and, and some of the speciation of selenium that people have not been looking at. I do know that, uh, you know, certainly in terms of the historically, people often associate aerosol selenium with coal and combustion of coal. Uh, and vanadium with combustion of oil, um, and you know, in that area there, it's much more the heavy oil that's being being used, not the coal, and that, that might be why we see more of the vanadium than the selenium. So I'm, okay. I'm happy to entertain any any emails for those who are interested, and again, I can help you uh, uh, find the data online. Um, the more people we can have studying air quality, oil sands, and, and, and using these data, um, the better off we're going to be. Okay, thank you, Professor Brooke. Uh, since you have this great monitoring data, and it's, it, it, I mean, it's very important to do the uh, cohort in this community, so we can maybe find some you know, interesting results. And is there any question from the audience? Um, well, if there's not, okay, let's say, thanks, Professor Brooks, thanks for your wonderful presentation. And if you have any questions, you can just email Professor Brooks. I think she will be very willing to answer you. Okay, so, uh, well, I was, so 